Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, this is the third version, third edition of the Crosstalk, Heavy Conversations About Light Metals. And it's absolutely fantastic and happy spring to everybody in this great warm weather and sunshine, I hope, across Canada. And I want to introduce myself. I'm Suman Shankar and I'm sitting in Hamilton, Ontario. And traditionally, this is the land of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and the Mississauga. And I would wish to acknowledge the ancestors who have really taken the time and efforts to make this land, preserve this land for us to enjoy the fruits of and live and, and cherish and be creative. So we're, and, and I'm just going uh, showing you some of the treaties with which we acknowledge the indigenous population and their contributions. And I hope this, uh, the, in the vein of crosstalk, we can further this collaboration and conversation and, and some of the further readings that you might be interested in is a book like Towards Braiding by Jimmy Elwood and uh, Vanessa Androti, who I, which was very influential for me to understand methods of uh, restorative justice and collaboratively working towards an improved future. With that being said, and uh, thank you for uh, that, I would like to move forward with the current topic of the day. And I would like to introduce the three compeers and the presenters and the organizers and the emerging professionals of this uh, forum, of this crosstalk, who are going to be um, curating this uh, program for you for the rest of the evening or afternoon. One is Abdullah, Jessica, and Michael. Fantastic. Uh, and it's an honor and a pleasure to, uh, to welcome the three emerging professionals in light metals. It's been an absolute honor and fantastic experience working with them all these years. And we have morphed this, this little seed idea into a, into a fantastic program, a Crosstalk. And I hope that this is gonna lead on to a much better uh, forum for cross, in, uh, cross uh, pollination of thoughts and ideas and creative endeavors. And with that, I wanna leave this and, and give the podium to, um, I guess, Jessica to carry on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, welcome to Cross talk, I'd just like to introduce the overarching crosstalk goal to create a frank informal discussion between industry personnel and those interested in the experience of working with light metals. Um, we hope to have true collaborative knowledge and exchange of viewpoints. And um, so we start off with a panel session. That'll be about 50 minutes. And then we move to breakout rooms where individual uh, Participants will have a chance to talk to our panelists and ask them questions. Just to note, this entire session is recorded and will later be up on the internet. Um, I will now pass you over to my co-host, Abdallah. Thank you so much, Jessica. So I'm Abdallah Al Sayed. Um, and so today's crosstalk is focusing on aluminum recycling. So we have three panelists who um, are experts in that area. And we got this, the idea for this topic after we did a survey um, on possible interesting light metals topics that our um, CIM members and others, the community at large would be interested in. Um, so if you have other ideas for other future topics, please let us know. You can reach out to Jessica, myself, or uh, Michael, or even uh, Sumat as well. Um, and then just, I wanna let you know about our next um, topic will be on additive materials and additive processes. And now I'll pass it on to uh, Michael, who will introduce our panelists. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Michael, and I'm joining you uh, from the University of British Columbia. Uh, and today, it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists. We have three fantastic panelists who are all going to talk to us about uh, aluminum recycling in Canada. Uh, and the first one is Danielle uh, Coudet, who is currently working at Alu Quebec. Uh, and she's a very experienced trader of recycled materials and works in coordination between suppliers, um, aluminum smelters and aluminum recyclers. Next slide please, Jessica, thank you. Uh, and our next presenter is Martin uh, Hartley, who is currently the president of Viami International. Uh, prior to that, Martin worked uh, at Alcan in the Shaped, uh, Shaped Products Division, uh, and he is working to develop international aluminum markets. Next slide, please. Thank you. And our final speaker is Francis uh, Breton, who works at Rio Tinto. Um, and upon joining Rio Tinto, he first worked in the processing division, uh, then moved over to research, and is now currently an advisor um, on adapting and developing new aluminum alloys. Okay, so um, thank you, Jessica. I think we can stop sharing the slides. 
And now that we've had our introduction, we're going to actually move right into our, our panel discussion with the first question. Um, so the first, so the way we'll do the questions is we'll have a, a question which will be directed to a specific panelist, um, and then we'll sort of open up to discussion with our, our other panelists. So starting out with our, our first question today, this will be directed first to Danielle. And it's just a question of, you know, what is, what's really cool or interesting about actually working in aluminum recycling? Well, thank you so much. Welcome to everybody. What's so cool? It's very sexy to be in recycling industry right now. It's a, a good opportunity, at least, to be part of a circular economy perspective, uh, if you look at it. Um, we have the chance to have uh, to work with aluminum, which is uh, recyclable uh, to infinite. So it's it's really a nice material to be uh, working with. Um, the um, the industry has begun a major transition toward reducing its environmental footprint, and I'm really proud of that. And that's what makes it uh, makes it so fun to work uh, in. Um, also, to being able to contribute to reach sustainable uh, development goals is really a nice aspect of this industry and recycling. Um, we have the chance to be among the leaders producing a very low carbon footprint um, material in Canada. And Quebec, it, of course, has the majority of the aluminum primary production and with two CO2 kilogram per kilogram of, uh, uh, per metric ton of aluminum produced, it's pretty, it's the lowest in the world. So in resume, it's to say work to contribute for a better environment now, um, reducing the industry carbon footprint is another good reason. Establishing leadership to provide tools to help the companies of the aluminum value chain to achieve sustainable sustainable uh, development goals. Well, all of that, I guess, is, is makes it uh, so excited, exciting. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you, uh, Danielle. Um, maybe I'll move over to um, Martin to see if you had any additional thoughts. What, what excites you about working in uh, recycling? Unmuting makes it easier. So, OK. <laughs> Well, um, for me, I, I must say, I, I said that before, but um, really when I look back 20 years ago or 25, when I started my career and, and you, you thought about recycling I, and you said, I'm going into recycling, then uh, you were basically placing yourself like um, just below a used car sales guy, you know, because um, it was not sexy. I mean, when you worked for a primary producer, if you uh, worked for an OEM, for anything else, it would have been better. Um, now this has completely shifted and with the, uh, the whole sustainability trip we're on, which is really great. Well, all of a sudden we're looking at, well, even, even the cleanest primary, you know what, it's still pretty dirty compared to, uh, recycling, um, especially aluminum. And, um, so, uh, all of a sudden recycling is getting like, uh, Danielle said, uh, sexy because, well, we're actually saving the planet and uh, aluminum is a dirty metal if you think about it if it is not recycled it is infinitely recyclable which is not really true i mean you're losing some of it so you will always need some primary but um obviously uh things have changed a lot technologies of sorting of uh, cleaning have improved so it has become actually a great place to work and uh, it's no longer with a negative image but it's actually really cool to be there Hey, great. Thanks so much. And maybe just rounding this out, Francis, do you have any thoughts on what's exciting about working in recycling? Good. Uh, so thanks for everyone to be there. Thanks for the invitation. So really what's interesting, I think Danielle and Martin did a, they talk a lot already. I think recycling, it's, it's really been talked about in the industry right now for uh, uh, the OEMs and the cars, the importance of recycling com content and reducing the CO2 and everything. Uh, and also, I think what's important for someone who wants to get into the industry and participate, I think it's like Martin said, 20 years ago, recycling, you can think it's a, maybe an old industry, but I think now it's almost a blank canvas again. Uh, you, there's a lot that needs to be reinvented um, because some people have old habits, but the market has changed. 
what needs to be done has changed. So there's a lot R&D that needs to be done, how to use the components. So it's interesting because we need to re reinvent and change the paradigm of what's happening in recycling, really. Okay, well, perfect. Thanks, thanks everyone for those answers. Um, now, just before we go on to the, the second question, before I hand over to Jessica, we actually have a few um, poll questions for the audience. And, and the purpose of these poll questions is really to help our speakers get a sense of where our audience is coming from. Um, so maybe Victoria, if you could share uh, our first poll question. Okay, so the first poll question is just simply just uh, trying to get a sense of where everyone is coming from geographically. So if you could just take a second here and respond to that poll, that'd be great. Okay, perfect. It looks like, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, most of our audience is coming from east, uh, Eastern Canada, some in Central and some in the West, um, as well as some from the US and some uh, international attendees. So uh, thanks, thanks to everyone who responded. And again, thank you all for, um, for joining us today. Um, we'll move on to the second poll question about some information about our audience. Um, and Victoria, if you can maybe show the second question here. This is a demographic about your, your background. So what, what level um, of experience do you guys have? And so seeing mostly here uh, graduate students, uh, two or three undergrads, um and some some people from industry and research so okay so good a good mix of, of people in different backgrounds so uh thanks everyone for that as well uh okay so with that i'm going to pass it over to jessica to lead the next um uh, question for our panelists so our next question is about the structure of the recycling system uh, what sectors does recycled material go to and come from and has that been changing? Danielle, can you start us off? Yeah, sure. So um, I've been being I've been, you know, sorry for my English today. It's like uh, anyway, um, there's two main sources of uh, recycled material that can be reused and it's either coming from post industrial production or from the post consuming uh, sector. And on those two type of scraps, uh, we we can mostly remelt the post-industrial at 100% percentage. And uh, post-consumer scrap is a challenge at this point because there's so much contamination, it's pretty tough to, to use it. Mainly those, uh, the principal sector of activity that produces uh, scrap is uh, from automotive sector from construction and uh, other sector like electrical or that type of thing. And it will go either um, to, uh, it will be reused in different ways, either remelt, either just uh, crunch or process in different ways. So uh, it, it will be usable again. When you, you uh, do you see the, uh, the transport sector is the largest generator? Do you, do you have this on? The screen okay i wasn't sure so you have here a uh, kind of a, a separation per percentage of all the old scrap and new scrap new scrap would be the production coming from what i call post-industrial activity i think it's uh, mainly what you can find and what go where do that scrap goes from canada it mainly goes in exportation to the us for a uh, different purpose of recycling and a little bit uh, offshore. But uh, we are mainly exporter of scrap, not importers, importators. I don't know if you want me to add something or if my colleagues want to add something. No, maybe I can step in there. Thank you, uh, Danielle. So I think it, it, the two graphs on the screen well shows where the, the scrap comes from. So yeah. the industries are not changing, but the ratio are changing. Yes. And what is changing a lot, what I was thinking just before about how the industry is moving differently. There's some industry sectors that we know how to recycle them correctly. And the cycle is done and perfected like the, the canning industry, but for example, a can goes back into itself every couple of months. Uh, if you look at electronics, 
take a couple of years. If you think about cars, uh, well, you need to think of what aluminum goes into the car will be coming back in 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and building construction could be 40 to 60 years. So that could impact. And how the basically different sectors are evolving as well is that some solutions for recycling materials is phasing out of automotive. And I always take the example, for example, of the uh, internal combustion engines that are big users of recycled scrap right now. These are phasing out. So what do we do with this kind of scrap? And we need to reinvent that cycle, for example, that right now we might not have a solution completely to absorb all of this kind of scrap. Maybe I should ask that uh, in the recycle aluminum usage by use and uh, the expectation for casting, what can you do with recycled aluminum? You can do casting, can stock, pellets for steel or other type of material or maybe flat roll uh, material. And in the casting, we expect by 226 that the demand for cast for automotive will change the portrait of what will be available in the future because the EVs arrival in the demand. So you don't make engine anymore, you make different things. So it's gonna be a little bit different. Maybe you have something else, So, So yeah, exactly. So basically the, the, the new parts that we need to be done, uh, we were talking about transmission casings that we use for automotive, normally we're big consumers of, of, of recycled material. And because these, uh, these industries are phasing out, we need to uh, develop new sorting because it, is a, it, is, it could be difficult to make the, the sorting industry change as well because they're used of a method to go, but then because their market is changing, we need to develop new technologies to sort, to be able to recycle in higher end products because automotive is shifting towards higher demanding products. So how can we change the industry uh, technically and log logistically as well? So there's a lot of evolution to do. Maybe I can step in uh, quickly. I mean, Sorting technologies are improving, cleaning technologies are improving. We find new technologies like uh, the, the LIPS technologies, laser-induced breakdown spectrometry um, that is being used. Uh, separation, separation technologies are improving and cleaning technologies are improving quite a bit. Now we have to really distinguish the, the, the new scrap, but to some extent also old scrap. We have these closed loop cycles, okay? So everything closed loop is pretty easy. As long as you keep it one alloy and you recycle it into the same alloy, like used beverage cans are a nice example. Wheels are another way, nice examples. You can recycle wheels almost endlessly into new wheels. You need to dilute. Dilution is always a solution to pollution, but um, okay. Uh, you can use most of the scrap, scrap that is used, but um, then uh, as uh, Francis brought up, uh, we have this, this kind of, um, when I'm originally from Germany and in Germany you have uh, 20 different recycling bins and you really separate uh, uh, brown grass from green grass and white glass and, and, and cans. And, and so you, you separate everything. And then there's this one, one thing in the end, this, this one container, and that is, oh, everything you couldn't fit into one of the 19 before, that goes in here. So that is exactly our problem that we had with internal combustion engines, that engine blocks, and like Francis mentioned, the, the transmission cases, all these things, they were made out of this, I say garbage alloy, and I don't wanna offend uh, these people, but the, the one that we couldn't recycle into anything else that went into this. And all of a sudden, the main, last resort uh, of this, the, the engines and transmission cases, um, they are disappearing. So our big challenge is really, well, how do we get that somewhere else? And the big problem is, is contamination. So um, uh, indeed. yeah, I mean, we always say our association says endlessly recyclable, yes, but every time you recycle, you pick up something. And well, when it ends in this last uh, garbage bin here, you have picked up so many things that it's almost impossible to make anything else out of it. So that is, in my opinion, our, our biggest challenge. How do we find a new home for this? Yeah, you're right. You know, we haven't thought, uh, we haven't talked about the packaging also, which is, uh, there's a lot of study and a lot of work make, uh, done right now to being able to separate multi-material multi, multi uh, material, uh, stuff, 
because uh, on some layer there's aluminum and plastic and paper and all that and lucky germany has two plant of pyrolies which is a, a technology that is used now and we're able to to pick the aluminum out of those type of packaging so that might change a little bit of the portrait of what was uh, eventually put into landfill so the objective in all that and we're right into all those effort common effort to reduce what will be going to landfill forever so uh, that's a good but in germany is definitely definitely uh, ahead of everybody on that <laughs> Hey, that really leads nicely to our next question, um, which is on the barriers there are to increasing the use of recycled aluminum or recycled material. And this could be technical barriers as well as economic, um, logistical, or any other kind of barrier. Um, I, re I really like that 19 bin, the, the, like a miscellaneous <laughs> bin of recycling. So maybe a, a barrier is, you know, having a 20th bin or something <laughs> so that, again, put that 19th bin into two. Um, yeah, maybe we'll start with Francis. Yes, yeah, so if I take this analogy again, the 19 bits, so technically, so there's a, a lot of barriers that can, so to, to get the scrap back into products. Uh, one of them is sorting. Uh, like we said, wheels could be easy. Uh, industrial scrap is easy because you know what you're dealing with. You know the alloys, they're normally clean. And uh, there's a problem with post consumer. Uh, so after the cars are shredded car, electronics, there was other processes like brazing that had zinc to the mix and all of this is shredded together. It's not really, it might not be segregated. So there's a chemical standpoint, especially technically. So what can we do maybe either to eliminate these elements or can we live with them uh, in the different alloys and where the market is going as well. So we look at the pile of scrap and we look also at the solution of the alloys. So if we're building a car, for example, the alloys are more demanding either for crash structures, battery enclosures, structural alloys. So these are really demanding. Uh, and typically, if an alloy is demanding on the aluminum side, it typically needs to be clean. Um, so chemistry wise, and also if I might go on their inclusion side as well. So when you remelt, remelting uh, scrap, generate oxides, these oxides are well wetted to the aluminum, so you need to de-wet these oxides, you need to clean the metal, you can have uh, other kind of impurities that goes in there. So we need, the technologies are evolving, uh, so cleaning technologies and chemical technologies, uh, but it needs to continue stepping up, especially for the 20th bin, which is quite hard chemically and quite hard on the, um, on the non-metallic inclusions uh, in it as well. So this is more on the technical side. Uh, I haven't maybe just a comment on the logistics side as well. Um, scrap is generated in the big agglomeration in cities uh, or in the US and Midwest. Sometimes the, time the plants are not situated there. So it is quite, sometimes you need to be able to bring the scrap back to where it is. Um, and normally scrap is not a dense material. Um, it's not a slabbing gut that weighs 20 metric tons and it's easy to transport on a rail car. It's going to be shredded materials. It's quite light. So that means a lot of transportation and transportation at the same time is quite the opposite of what we're trying to do, which is uh, limit the green gas and uh, the total CO2 emissions. Great. Thank you. Uh, maybe Martin or Danielle, if you want to chime in as well, uh, maybe Martin will yeah. start. Well, um, I mean, yeah, Francis uh, hit it exactly. Um, another thing that I, I see is, uh, I mean, you could sometimes integrate scrap, but then you need the infrastructure as well. So, um, uh, I mean, I see this all the time. I, I'm working, for example, right now with a, a German OEM and they, they are foundries and uh, they say, hey, we could integrate, for example, wheel scrap, but all of a sudden, oh my gosh, my, my furnaces don't allow me to easily integrate scrap because uh, it's so much easier to put in a bundle of ingot because, oh, my forklift truck takes it and puts it in. But now I'm trying to put in these little pieces of, of scrap into my furnace. And uh, well, they all of a sudden realize my infrastructure, my, my equipment isn't able to handle this. So um, yeah, one thing is uh, the scrap comes with 
impurities that I don't want and in oxides and whatever, and, and I need to clean them out. But the other thing is, how do I even get them into my process? So I see that as another hurdle because I see it with a lot of people that, uh, well, how do I get it? And then uh, talk about um, more exotic scrap or a div more difficult scrap, like, like saw chips, you know, uh, machining chips. Right. Um, then now you're really getting into challenges that you're not just burning it off, but actually getting real material out of it. So. And these kind of materials, if I just say, they float and they burn. They don't want to mix in exactly. and melt. So yeah. this is another issue. Yes, you know, it is right. It burn and char, but yeah. yeah, well, the only thing I can add to all what you have said um, is the, the missing links in the chain. Like this is a real portrait of what we have in Quebec and Ontario. There are some, not that many remelter that can take care of. There are some in Ontario, I must say, I'm more into Quebec portrait, but uh, uh, remelters are not of a real scrap and availability of scrap also. You talked about Francis density, uh, you're right. And also leo, uh, geological, where geography is, is a, a problem to, uh, to bring all that scrap together also. But we work on it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, now we have two more questions from our audience. For our audience, first one: um, What are you interested in learning from this talk? So it looks like most are gravi gravitating well, not too so unsurprisingly, about the aluminum recycling field, and then secondly, about technical skills. And then also so a little bit of uh, job search tips or insider advice. And then their second question. Um, now this is kind of what your your educational background is, or what your field of uh, of uh, study or field of uh, experience is. So mostly materials, it looks like, with some mechanical and some chemical. Perfect. Okay. Now I think the next uh, question will be from uh, Michael. Perfect. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, so those first uh, three or four questions that we had, they were all really focused on um, the actual industry itself and understanding the recycling industry. But now we're, we'll shift the, the topics of our questions a little bit. Now we'll actually look at the um, at the people who are working in the industry. So I guess that from that uh, first poll question there, it seemed like at least the second most popular answer was uh, you're interested in learning about some of the technical skills um, required for this industry. So our, our first question in this section is, and when you look at the people who are working in, in the uh, recycling industry, what are the technical skills that allow people uh, to be successful? So I guess we'll start uh, in this case with uh, Mark's end. Okay, well, technical skills, um, actually, I should say all of them are great, okay? We have most of them in materials, that is wonderful. Um, if you're, if you have a metallurgical background, certainly helps, uh, of course, well, how much aluminum did you actually learn when you do a metallurgical background? Well, probably not that much, at least, well, when I studied way back, um, I did not, I had only a few lessons on aluminum and most of the, the other thing was steel and whatever else, but, um, yes, metallurgical background, extremely uh, important, but then don't forget the mechanical, don't forget the chemicals. So everything that you have can be very interesting. You're looking at it from a different angle. And the more you understand, the better it is. And uh, I think you just need to be extremely open and learn a lot more. Just take it that you might only use a few percent of what you learned at the university, but um, the, the few things you learn, well, you will expand it a lot and then you will add a lot more to it. Because um, in this field, well, you have to learn about, uh, well, what Francis said, well, what are the impurities and what are they doing to it? Why are they harmful and how do I get them out? But then you also learn about, um, uh, or you have to learn about uh, what are the different elements doing? Where can I find a different home? Um, you know, we have, uh, for example, I'm, I'm working with, uh, with Ecomel, which is a wheel recycler. And um, when you get wheels, some of them are chrome coated. So they, they actually contain about 1% nickel and they contain copper. So if nickel and copper gets into new wheels, it's extremely harmful because it causes corrosion. But guess what? 
uh, nickel. Not long ago, I looked it up. Uh, the price was $100,000 per ton, while aluminum is at 3000 So you can imagine that 1% nickel is basically as much worth as, as the whole aluminum in this wheel. So finding a different home, okay, well, we found it. Piston manufacturers, they use exactly the same type of alloy, but with, with copper and with nickel. So um, having a metallurgical background, but also some mechanical engineering background, well, which other industries use these? And then how can I separate this? And, uh, and then chemical background, how can I clean it, for example? Um, all of these are really useful. So whatever you bring is great. Just be prepared. You need to learn a lot more probably and in other fields that you're not currently covering, which makes it really interesting. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, maybe Francis, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I think I want to continue what Martin is saying of being looking what other people are doing. You need to be curious and Im Im imaginative on the different way you can use the scrap if you find another solution for you said the chrome the copper nickel wheels into pistons so how you can do this so this you can learn in school your metallurgy and you know what's going to the, the uh, impact of elements or impurities but when you go present in shows uh, you go to com you go to the cast expo you go to the conferences go on the show floor and talk to see what other peoples are doing. Because you can learn a lot on, well, how to use a technology that is used in another sector to your benefit, or how we can use your remote material into somewhere else. Uh, or even at universities, you can see how does, what does the physics department's doing on uh, fiber optics to do measurements. Well, oh, maybe I can use that to measure my chemical composition, do my sorting. So be curious of what's happening next to you. It's good, to, you need to know your basics because this is your main business and that's what you're gonna be doing. What's the impact of my elements and my impurities? But then to, to take that step a bit more forward, you need to try to implement something that's most of the time, if you look at the patents, 95% of patents is using something that is already exists some, somewhere else. So this is where you can be curious and looks what's good. Uh, so, and how you can implement it really. Great, thank you, Francis. And, and Danielle, if you had any, any thoughts on technical skills required? Yeah, technical. Well, it all depends where you stand in the, you know, along the, the value chain. If you find yourself working more in the sorting and the scrap, uh, it takes a lot of uh, chemistries all along, I guess. It's important to have a little bit of it to understand the alloy and the way to use it or remelt it. But never forget that communication skills are very useful. <laughs> I think it's part of it to be able to, to really uh, explain or uh, sell or whatever you're doing in the value chain. That, that's for sure you will need to be able to share your knowledge with other people. And uh, maybe also. Uh, everything that is around environmental regulations and stuff that's also very useful for now and it will become more and more with sustainability sustainability goals so i think that kind of leads us into our next question which is other than technical skills what kind of skills and advice would you give to students thinking of en entering this industry um Martin, can you start us off? Yeah, sure. So um, Danielle mentioned that already. So the whole environmental engineering background um, and environmental science is, is definitely very important because why are we pushing this recycling so much right now? It is because we want to become more sustainable. We want to reduce carbon footprint. And um, I mean, when you go there, that's a whole science in itself. And uh, I think I could spend my entire time right now just helping companies calculate and reduce their carbon footprint. And most of that is done by recycling. And then how do you do it actually? But uh, just calculating the carbon footprint. And there you can, you can almost come with a, a philosophy PhD as well, because uh, where do you reset the carbon footprint to zero? Because is that only when it otherwise lands into a landfill or is that already when it's recycled when it's in process scrap 
what do you want to incentivize? Um, how do we calculate? So that is one thing. Um, what uh, Danielle said, of course, communication skills are very important. Um, when you deal with scrap, you know, um, again, EcoMelt, I use them as an example, recycling wheels in Canada and the United States, um, they are dealing typically with about uh, 400 different scrap yards that they call up every day every morning to find out hey how many wheels do you have you know and and you're fighting for these good scrap units against other people so having good interpersonal skills is very good you're dealing with family businesses so um that certainly helps um and then the other thing really don't forget uh, economics business skills of very course. important because ultimately yes we all want to reduce carbon footprint and and be environmentally friendly but you know what nobody wants to pay for it so you have to find creative ways that it economically makes sense for everybody to do it so that would be my advice uh danielle or francis do you have any additions to that maybe just uh eco conception uh industrial ecology all that type of thing could be you know they, there are places for those people to work in the industry as well uh, maybe think more in terms of use recycle reuse recycle <laughs> i think it goes all with uh, the skills you need to to have when you want to enter this uh, very nice industry if i might add i talked about make making contacts which is important to know what's happening. The remelt market is you need to know all the players. So there's the OEM producers, what's it gonna be using and what you should expect in a couple of years, the scrap yards, what's in it. And also economically, and if I had, we are looking at re reducing CO2 emissions, but you need to know, it's you need to get interested of what's the economics behind it and the social politics behind it as well. Because if you, you, want, you want to be working the right direction, for example, right now um, to have a zero CO2 footprint with remelt, it needs to have been a post-consumer scrap. Uh, but if you're using a pre-consumer scrap, sometimes you'll be impacted by CO2 emissions of the primary products. So you need to, be, uh, to know what's, what are the impacts of what you're doing economically and also uh, for the CO2 emissions, because that's what you're trying to do at the end. So if Martin, you have a, a comment on this. Yeah, well, that was the philosophical part of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, because you need to be sure to be working on this, the right direction. So if, if even if you find a really good technical solution, um, at the end of the day, recycling is about reducing CO2. So you need to be sure that you're aiming towards that goal too. Thank you so much. So I think I go on to, I'll be going on to the next question. Um, now, what gaps do you see with personnel coming in into the industry? Um, or sorry, yeah, in the, in the, coming into the industry, you think in the next you know few years or the next decade or so. So this could be technical things that the people are lacking or gaps or maybe other type of gaps as well. Um, maybe we'll start with uh, Francis. Well, one of the gaps, uh, there's a technical focus, but also, uh, if I might say, there's a, we discussed it a bit at the beginning of how the, the uh, industry is perceived. It could be perceived as an old industry, a dirty industry, uh, but it's been reinvented now. But it is sexy, if I might say. You need to get a bit your hands dirty and get in it and trying to reinvent it. So sometimes there's a bit of a gap there. I know it's a bit of a weird, it's not a technical gap, but you need to go see what's happening on the sh on the floor. Um, you might have these uh, wonderful models that tell you this is where the chemistry goes and where that's where it should happen. But in the end of the day, uh, all of this these efforts get um, put aside because you didn't know that the, all the scrap will go into one same dump truck, uh, and all your big efforts will be cancelled there. So don't be afraid to get your hand dirty. Go on the show floor and see what's happening. And then to to look at the to develop actual solution that you can implement. Uh, if I might say, with the tech, technically side, 
uh, we are evolving on cleaning technologies, on sorting technologies, and on adapting alloys for, um, this is more technical, adapting alloys for impurities uh, and stuff like this. Martin or Danielle, if you had some other comments too on some possible gaps that you're noticing. Martin oh, is ready. Um, <laughs> to be honest, the biggest gap when it comes to personnel and coming in is that we're people. I mean, um, uh, well, Danielle said it uh, nicely. It's a sexy industry, but unfortunately, a lot of young people don't really see it that way. And um, when I look back 20 years ago, and uh, I thought of the average age of uh, people who attended our conferences, and I look at today, 20 years later, I have the impression the average age has gone up, maybe not by 20 years, but <laughs> um, by a lot. And I mean, we're missing young people that want to come in and want to do this and uh, work in our industry. And we're missing people pretty much everywhere along the value chain. And we need new skills because, I mean, calculating carbon footprint and knowing um, the greenhouse protocol uh, uh, and uh, the IAI standards and how to calculate according to this. Well, you know what? I have 25 years or more experience, but you know what? I never used that. I never had that because this is all new. So we need we need young people to come into our industry, and that's our biggest gap. We need more people. So in case every, anybody's listening and um, would like to to get into this industry, let me know because <laughs> I'm getting at least one call a day. Don't you know somebody who would work for us in doing this and wow. Well, I think that leads us perfectly into our next poll question. Um, so this is for our attendees to ask, um, have you ever considered a career in the recycling industry? So let us know your thoughts. Lots of people are thinking about it now. That's great to hear. Well, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear people are considering it. And I hope this crosstalk has made it positive impact on your information. Um, we're, we've got one more question and then we're gonna head to the breakout rooms. Um, so Michael, I'll pass you over for asking the last question. Hey, perfect, thanks Jessica. So uh, I, I guess our first block of questions, again, we, we talked about the aluminum industry as a whole and some of the trends um, that we see there and we, we shifted toward a, more of a focus on the people in the um, industry. And now one sort of uh, forward-looking question is, um, we, you know, we'd like to know a little bit more about some of the initiatives that maybe your company has uh, participated in, or maybe some of the trends in the, the industry in general about promoting things like equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, so maybe, Francis, if you want to start with that. Yes, I might talk to um, what Rirutinto has done recently on uh, how to include a lot more diversity, equity, into our inclusivity in our plants and our industry. Uh, so the first step that we did is basically we did a, a third party investigation on our plants uh, culture inside the business. So because before, well, at the same time as including more people and hiring strategies, you need to understand how to keep them in as well. How does people behave on the plant? And this report is public, so you can go on the website and see it. Uh, and how to, you can control, uh, for example, bullying, if it happens, um, sexual harassment or racism on the workplace. So you need to understand what's happening. So there was a third party study, some good results, some not so good results. Uh, I'll be completely transparent. So this, and now Rio has put in place really task force uh, everywhere on the world to address these issues. Uh, so for example, if I take the example in Quebec, um, in the saint lac saint jean region, there's a task force in the committee that includes people of all diversity and everybody in the, on the workplace from plant uh, personnel on the floor to directors and CEOs that are participating to implement different actions to promote a lot more uh, inclusion, diversity and equity in hiring and also in, in retention. You want to keep people like this uh, inside. So I think that was the first step the company did to, to retrospects on ourselves on what's happening and then implement solutions uh on hiring and retention as well yeah that's great to hear thanks thanks francis uh maybe martin i'll go to you next 
Yeah, um, I must say, I'm, uh, I find that pretty fascinating how this is all of a sudden coming up and it, it is growing the whole theme. And um, um, I, had, I had never before been asked if I could uh, participate in a third party evaluation of companies' perception in terms of diversity and inclusion, sustainability, of course, and things like that. And you actually have this now, so it's coming. And then, um, I mean, we have international organizations that um, go mainly in towards uh, sustainability. I mean, Francis Riachinto is part of uh, the Aluminum Stewardship Initiative, for example, and um, with Ecomelt, uh, we joined there as well. And um, a lot of people and across the entire value chain are joining those. And um, I mean, I see that uh, that is just exploding right now. It's uh, it almost wasn't there um, even five years ago. I mean, I was there uh, when we when we started the aluminum stewardship initiative um, more than ten years ago, and it was kind of going like this. And just the last year, it's it's just going up like that. So it's it's great to see. Yeah, wonderful. And um, <laughs> Danielle, maybe I'll go to you. Yeah. For the that's good input here. Well, sure. Um, you know, when you think about the small and mid, it's not all like Rio Tinto, the big company, and OEM, which is you know, which is uh, well organized as and has the resource, the resources to uh, to meet those goals of you know being uh, more inclusive and all that stuff. If you look at the small and medium enterprises. Um, it becomes sometimes uh, an advantage to be more competitive is if you are going into those uh, different uh, subject, let's say, or it, it becomes a competitive advantage and even could be a teaser to welcome new employees. And that's the way to use it because they have not that much other use inside the company, they have no time, they have no resource, they have no employees dedicated to it, but they will do it and they will get more inclusive, more equal if they see it as an advantage for them, for their sales. That's for sure. It will be a requirement from the client. Wonderful. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks to everyone. And so, like I said, it's um, great to hear all this and that you everyone's actively promoting these sort of EDI initiatives. Uh, so I'll now turn it over to uh, Jessica Rabella. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to our panelists for introducing us to the recycling ecosystem. It was a very interesting talk and lots of great niche information. Um, and thank you also to the other people who helped arrange this, including Victoria and Brigitte.